Thank good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our third session um, on COVID-19 uh, vaccinations and policies. I uh, am uh, honored to be joined today by four colleagues, um, both in the states uh, and in um, uh, the UK. I'm going to introduce uh, folks, um, and then I'm going to have uh, just a few kickoff comments on sort of where we're at. Uh, globally, where the cases are, where we're at with some vaccinations. Um, and then um, I'm going to start pitching some questions out. I'm going to be actively monitoring the uh, questions in the chat function. So uh, toss out your pressing questions and we'll we'll um, queue them up to um, uh, various panelists um, as appropriate. So um, I'm joined today by Kevin uh, Bampton, who's the CEO of the British Educational Hygiene uh, Society, um, it's the Chartered Society for Worker Health Protection. Um, Kevin is a, a former law professor and uh, he joins um, the society after a career involving um, higher education and senior management, um, working with the United Nations and international development. Um, he's worked extensively with um, chartered and professional societies in the development um, of their professional services and qualifications. He has a long-standing commitment to employment rights and we're super excited to have him. I also have with me, um, uh, and Kevin's in Scotland today, um, I also have Jayette Moon, who's uh, stateside with me in Delaware. Um, Jayette has master's degrees in biomedical engineering from Drexel um, University in Philadelphia. He's a, a certified project um, and risk management professional. Um, he's a chartered quality professional um, in the UK. He's also an enterprise um, risk management certified professional and risk management society. Um, and a certified risk management professional. He's a fellow of um, ISM and the Royal Society of Arts. Um, and um, he's excited about his new book, The Foundations of Quality Risk Management. Um, it was just recently uh, released by SQ uh, Quality Press. So we're gonna be talking a lot about risk with Jay I'm excited to have him. Um, Michael um, Lavery is in uh, Newcastle today. Um, Michael's an expert in uh, stakeholder communications the founder and CEO of award-winning international marketing and communications consultancy firm Brand and Reputation. Um, uh, Michael's a former executive director of communications um, uh, in the private and higher ed uh, sectors. Um, he's worked in crisis management, um, both internal and uh, worked on both internal and external communications strategies um, in many different types of sectors. Um, from working on major incidents at power stations um, to reputation issues at hospitals and universities. So we're looking forward to Michael's unique perspective there. And lastly, we have Scott uh, Moffat, who's up in Aberdeen. Um, Scott is an expert in human factors, um, in particular in the field of behavioral safety um, and the six NTS skills. So stress management, communication, situational awareness, decision-making, teamwork, and leadership. Um, he's got over 10 years of experience observing these skills in simulated environments and contextualizing them into different roles across high hazard industries. And boy, Scott, your, your work is going to be really important as we're trying to get people back to work um, uh, productively and safely. Um, so uh, we're super excited to hear your um, your take on the um uh, you know the safety of getting folks back to work and where their the cognitive piece fits into that and so um, i'm Anna mcgarry i am a principal owner at the colden corporation um, i also have a role in ac uh, academics as um, a visiting scientist at the harvard th chan school of public health and um you know as an epidemiologist i've been working um you know long hours like we all have in health and safety and risk management over the past year and um am interested to watch this phase as we're trying to move things from pandemic to endemic, um, as we're trying to roll out the vaccines um, it, it sort of and, and thinking about all the other controls um, that we put in place, it kind of was easy to tell everyone to go home, right? When we didn't know enough, how do we undo that? How do we unwind um, that? How do, what science do we need to get people back um, productively and safely? So as we're in our 17th or 18 month, depending upon how you count um, the start of the pandemic, we've had 154 million cases um, and 3.2 million deaths. Um, right, right now, um, things are 
uh, super dichotomous in hot spots and, and places that are doing well. Um, the cases right now are fueled by very few spots around the world, India, some spots in South America, uh, Turkey. So just looking again as things are getting better in other places, they're ramping up in others, recognizing fully that um, we may have folks on the line in a range of situations um, as far as cases and, and rollouts and getting back to work. The vaccine rollout is going great in some places, same as cases, going great in some places, uh, not so well in others. Um, a fair portion of the planet might not get vaccinated even later this year or early next year. And again, recognizing there's going to be a range. Um, we've got about 1.2 million doses, uh, excuse me, billion, B billion doses rolled out now. Um, we've got some places doing great. Um, Israel's got 56 percentage uh, points of its um, uh, population with uh, that are fully vaccinated. The U.S. is around 45 percent. In South America, even some bright spots, we've got 43 percent of folks vaccinated there. But then a fair portion of Africa uh, largely won't get vaccinations until later this year or early next year. So um, again, crazy range of where we're at. So this session, I I want to um, we're going to talk about vaccines. We're going to tee up some general concepts um, of getting back to work and what that means and how we're going to communicate with folks, what kind of policies we need. This session wasn't isn't meant to be a debate about the validity of vaccines or whether we believe they work or not work or what it's sort of or or even largely any kind of governmental comments on how things have been rolling out and and what it what governments around the globe have been doing for policies and whether we like them or not. I think we want to take a, a more practical scientific approach. You know, the vaccines are out there. Um, how are people taking them up? What kinds of policies are working, um, again, to get people back safe? And so with that, I'm going to pitch out to Kevin first. Um, you know, Kevin, you're in a unique spot, you know, from the 20 or 30,000 foot view of policy um, for your members, getting folks back to work. I sort of have a double, double-edged question. It's sort of have you seen things that have really worked that, that you want folks to replicate? And have you seen things that haven't gone so well? And I just sort of, I'll leave it a little open-ended for you. Okay, so sort of back to work, return to work has been sort of something that we're, we're sort of returning to ourselves because after the first lockdown in the UK, I think BOHS was the first scientific society to sort of say, this is gonna be a really big issue. Um, having done the lockdown, having started lockdown, how do you get out of it? And it's like a lot of things. You put in a set of controls. How do you take those controls out? Um, and I think, think the things that we have observed as working well have been, you know, the application of, you know, really basic principles of risk management and, you know, occupational hygiene science. So using the hierarchy of controls. Um, so, you know, let's not sort of rush to the last line of defense loads of people running around with PPE and face coverings, not going to really deal with, with the problems and it's not going to enable you to be able to work effectively. So thinking well about the administrative, ergonomic approaches, etc. Not over, not over promising on the engineering side. There are lots of people who know that ventilation, for example, general ventilation, really important. With all the work that we've done to reduce carbon emissions, lots and lots of buildings have really poor general ventilation, lots of recirculation. But then people go out and buy you no know, stuff that the state snake oil salesmen come out with, you know, UV units that sort of pretend to be able to do everything for every. You know, like most things, sort of the basic principles of what you know what works, etc., what is proven. Um, help. So, so the, in answer to your question, the, sort of, the things that we're seeing work well is the application of common sense and control um, in a graduated hierarchy. The things that we see that are going horribly wrong is people sort of trying to find a quick fix and looking for sort of exit routes, etc. And I mean, we, you know, we recently released a press release on the vaccine um, after doing some monitoring work and people going to work. A lot of people are sort of working on the basis, well, we're all vaccinated or a lot of us are vaccinated and, you know, we don't really need to worry about other control. And yeah, it's great to have that liberated feeling. But 
No, vaccines don't prevent against asymptomatic transmission in all cases. Not all people within the workplace are going to be able to benefit from a vaccine immediately because there are some groups that are potentially vulnerable or might not have taken up. So the, 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 the approach is to keep some controls in place and to use a little of a lot of different things rather than putting all your eggs in one basket. A typical risk management type of approach, spread your, your, your range of different controls and there's a better chance for you being able to operate sort of normally. Excellent. Yeah, Kevin, I think over the last year, health and safety professionals have spent way too much time debunking snake oil. Um, you know, this we've had people with wanting folks to walk through sanitation tunnels that spray, you know, horrible chemicals on people or, uh, you know, ultraviolet light wands that we're going to put all over. And, and so, yeah, I think a good dose of sensibility is in um, certainly in order um, and uh, <laughs> to be well, well proved, especially as we get back this fall. And there's always an opportunity for more um, for more uh, nonsense. Um, so Michael, I'm gonna ask you, so given the face that we're gonna get back to basics, we're gonna stick with the hierarchy of controls, um, as we're rolling out those policies, as we're getting more and more people vaccinated, um, on the communication side, um, as leaders are trying to um, identify folks, who do you see the key audiences for getting folks back? Do they need different messages? Um, what can leaders do to prepare themselves to to communicate the policies, and 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 if, and what what efficacy can can we expect? Thanks, Sharon. Uh, I think it's really important that we recognise that there are different audiences, and and we need a nuanced approach. We we can't have a one size fits all model to any communications. Never mind a, a communication which is loaded with such. Um, sensitivity and will be something that is of great concern to so many of our employees. So I think we mustn't see communications as a blunt instrument that just um, provides information in, a, uh, in, in one way. It's, it's not just about provision of information, it's not just about broadcasting one way. We must find ways to connect, that we must listen just as effectively as we, as we provide information. So I think with that culture in mind, we need to think carefully about the audiences that we're trying to engage and we need to think about the the effect of that communication again it's not enough for us to just provide information and then tick the box to say that we've we've done our job that everybody knows now what's what's happening we need to understand what are people's uh, concerns what is, what is any nervousness what questions might they have and we have to anticipate the reaction to the to the news that we're providing the information that we're providing um, and we need to think about audiences in a in a segmented way. So we need to think about um, these are perhaps new members of our team, new employees who are unfamiliar with the environment and are now going to be faced with another layer of, of information or challenges around around uh, vaccine compliance. Um, we need to think about uh, well-established uh, employees of our organisations who perhaps have seen uh, issues and crises and new policies come and go. How can we address their cynicism? How can we address their sure footedness and make sure that they are just as vigilant and um, as uh, careful in the way that they go about their work to ensure again that, that, that we're complying and making it safe for everybody? Um, I think we can use um, the network of champions. So that could be um, that could be team leaders or supervisors, it could be trade union representatives. It could just be the uh, very well respected, very positive, um, you know, the, the key social people in our different communities of, of employees that we think we can we can utilize to help cascade and amplify our messages more effectively. It's it's much better than just that top down approach. If we can um, interpret and translate communications that are relevant for each function of our of our organization. So. That's certainly the, the approach we'd need to take, a segmented approach for audiences when we look at em, employers. But then we also have to think about partners and suppliers and actors. We need to think about visitors to our sites. We need to think perhaps about the family of our employees, about the concerns they might have 
about their loved ones returning to the workplace uh, with, with different restrictions and, um, and, and different requirements. So I think, as with anything, um, communications must, must be strategic. Um, we must carefully map our audience, identify their particular needs and requirements, set objectives for our communication with each of those audiences, and find ways that we're going to connect with them. We're going to get feedback. We're going to um, be able to respond and interact and, and make sure that we're using the right channels and developing the right content to facilitate that kind of experience, that kind of interaction. So a strategic approach, but one that uh, very carefully maps the audiences that we're trying to engage. And it's much more than just asking the boss to send out an all staff message or an all staff memo. We must think strategically about, about our communication. Michael, I love that you used and, and brought up the concept of listening, right? So communication inherently probably should be two ways in, in the middle of a crisis, right? And so what are some creative ways that you see um, uh, employers listening? Is it is it these pulse surveys? Is it webinars? Is it group in-person meetings to the extent it's safe? What are, what are some creative ways you're seeing employers listen? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the days have gone of a, a notice pinned on a, a poster pinned on a notice board or a, a, a memo from, from management that's, that's widely circulated, photocopied, faxed around an organization. Those days have, have gone. We, we have to have um, localized opportunities for interaction. So that could be in your team or departmental meetings. It could be with your team leader or your supervisor. They can be your regular one-to-ones where you have a one-to-one -one meeting with a supervisor about your work about your um your project your career development build into those kind of conversations questions about the communications D did you see that latest policy have you seen the change to our uh, requirements for for the workforce and that we are gathering information at, at every opportunity in terms of more creative ways that then yes utilizing technology so whether it's webinars or um, you know, video conference meetings like this, where we can open up the chat function, where we can field questions, that we perhaps have panel presentations rather than again a, a, a diktat, a one-way um, presentation from a, a senior manager who then finishes their deck of slides and, and exits stage left, that we have more, more opportunities for interaction. I think you could also look at having um, you know, a, a questions, a suggestions box. You can have um, an open clinic or an open forum where people could come along, perhaps on a lunch break, um, and, and ask questions. Um, you would identify the champions that help you to cascade the information out can also be the champions that collate and gather information and, and bring it back to you. So perhaps having a communications working group, which has representatives from across the workforce, that has a representative of us, of, a, of your suppliers or subcontractors or your visitors um, or your various partners. And, and you have a communications group that's reviewing how did that last message go out? How was it received? What are the reservations, the concerns that people are raising with you? What are you hearing? What, 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 what are the things that we should be thinking about for our next communication? What are the things we need to clarify that haven't landed very well with that last communications um, campaign that we that we rolled out. So I think there are lots of ways that we can do that. I think you want to avoid mm -hmm. doing it on, on public platforms, Shannon, like like social media, you know, so posting a, a, a new policy on, mm -hmm. on Twitter or on a Facebook group and having everybody piling in, sometimes under the cloak of anonymity and, and you know, trolling and trying to score points and making their grievances very public is, is not the way to manage um, either your internal um, authority or to, to manage your external reputation and brand. So I think it's about using the right secure platforms uh, in terms of technology, but not overlooking the opportunity of just listening um, face to face, one to one, small groups and, and finding ways to have eyes and ears on the on the shop floor, on the factory floor, in the office, to, to get that information and, and feed it back up. There has to be a way to feed it back up to, uh, to, the, to the powers that be. Excellent, yeah, thank you, Michael, that's awesome. 
So we've got some policies that we know are going to work and not work. We're going to certainly listen and we're going to communicate. When I think about the nuts and bolts of getting folks back to work, it's it's been a very stressful year. It's been a very stressful year for uh, different people in different ways. Um, and as a health and safety professional, we want to make sure people are safe. And people that are stressed um, tend to have more accidents, people that are tired. Um, uh, and so um, to that extent, Scott, I'm going to toss out to you, um, how do you think the pandemic has affected our ability to work safely and our cognitive abilities um, and our decision making? Um, what's, what is, what's the road look like of getting back and, and where are the bumps going to be and, and how long are they going to last for folks, do you think? Well, thanks, John. That's a great question. So in short, uh, during the whole pandemic, and like you say, all the stress, the more stress we're under, the harder it is for our brain to take in and process information. And I think the one thing, regardless if we've been put on furlough or whether you're continuing through, is the one thing that we can definitely, well, we definitely know, is that people are under more stress. So if you're under more stress and pressure, the brain can't take in and process information. So it's kind of you've got half the workforce, not half the workforce, but some people might have been working right the way through. So if you're under that amount of stress and pressure, basically the two main parts to your memory, your working memory, your long-term memory, these two need to speak to each other. So how you take in information from the environment goes through into the long-term memory, these two speak to each other and everything's okay. You add stress in there and what stress does is it puts up a barrier so the working memory and the long-term memory can't speak to each other, which means if you're then not got the ability to take in and process information, your long-term memory will just go back to what it knows. So instead of looking at a situation and your brain taking the information in, your long-term memory is just going to be like, oh, I've done this before, I know what it is. So instead of processing the information, although your brain's incredibly powerful, it's incredibly lazy. And before you know it, your brain can take you down that garden path without us even knowing, unfortunately. And it's like that for those that have been furloughed. So if you've, one of the things that we do at BFC is we do a lot of simulation exercises, we do uh, training courses, we also do competency assessments. And I was assessing, I think it was last October, last November, and the person, and we just make sure that their, their technical skills and their non-technical skills uh, go hand in hand and they're safe to go back offshore. And before the assessment even started, the person said, I can barely process information when I'm at home at the moment. I haven't been offshore in six months. How on earth am I supposed to go offshore and work in a high hazard industry? And I was like, ah, oh, yeah. So what we were trying to teach and what we teach and is if you have been, say, on furlough and you're working right the way through, your brain's not going to be doing what it's programmed to do. So the, the confirmation bias, for especially for those that have been on furlough, if you've done a task a hundred times, you can't do the task the hundred and first time, your brain's got that preconceived idea of what it's expecting to see. So if they haven't been off, say offshore, working in a bank, working whatever, it's their brain's going to go back to what it's used to seeing. So again, they turn up to work after say six, seven months, their brain's like, I've been here before, no problem at all, it forgets the last six, seven months. And unfortunately, uh, errors can go wrong because the brain, like we were saying, it will create the picture that we're wanting to see and not the evidence and the information that's in front of us. And simple things, it's just come back to basics. I think Michael mentioned it there earlier. One of the things, it doesn't matter what industry we're in, high hazard or any industry, it's just thinking about what to do if something goes wrong. Because we need to realise now that we're human beings and this pandemic, if ever things were going to go wrong, unfortunately, it's when we come out of this at the other end. So it's just taking the time, if even when you're starting routine tasks, just to think, what am I going to do if something goes wrong? It just then prepares the brain. So if it does go wrong, it's sitting there, you've thought about it, the chances of you freezing are dramatically reduced. And even the likes of distractions, trying to eliminate as many distractions as possible. You can say you're distracted for even five seconds. It can take your brain between four and six times the initial distraction to go back to where you were before you were distracted. So that's your normal day. You get distracted five seconds. You're looking at 15, 20 seconds. That's normal sort of working. That's not without taking in all the stress and pressures of everyday life at the moment. 15 to 20 seconds is a long time for your brain to come back round. So a nice simple thing. If you get distracted, regardless of your work, regardless of what the task is, 
always, always go back to where you were before you were distracted. It will just allow your brain to start taking in and processing the information. But going back to the question, unfortunately, our cognitive capabilities aren't going to be anywhere near where they were before the pandemic started, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so on the communication, on the training side, is there a, um, do leadership and managers need um, need a different approach to sort of the re-entry and the retraining? Maybe the regular training that we're used to doing isn't appropriate right now, or is it a, a, an altered form? And is there, a, we necessarily, so as Michael was saying, listening is just as important as communicating out. Is it sort of, is there a, a do loop to hear back from folks as they're getting back? Like, oh, I don't remember how to do this, or this isn't going well. Um, have you had any of that kind of um, interaction, Scott? It was really good to hear Michael saying listening. Listening is the most important part of communication. We can all talk. We've all been talking since we're three, four, five years of age. Um, it's having the ability to listen that makes good communicators, that makes good leaders. Um, and it's also the listening, but we need to go back to the basics with how we ask certain questions, how we communicate with small groups and individuals. The days are gone of just turning to your work colleague and saying, are you okay? Do you know what you're doing? That doesn't check understanding. It doesn't check the brain's doing what it should be doing. So it's going back to the simple things of asking the open questions. What are we doing? How are we doing it? Why are we doing it? It just means that the brain has to process the information. It has to think, and then you can get a clear answer to actually check if they're brain is doing what it should be doing and it's as simple things as it's very easy with communication especially when we get put under stress and pressure we don't mean to but the words and the sentences we use can change or manipulate the picture that somebody has in their brain so if you even think about say like the leading questions how you put the answer you want to hear into the question so like it's generator two isn't it the moment you hear isn't it people just agree They'll hear the answer and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, that's correct. And without even meaning to, you've just told them the answer. You've created a picture in their brain and you've sent them down that garden path. So, yeah, exactly as you're saying, listening, hugely important. Going back to the basics with how we ask certain questions. But it's also, from a leadership perspective, it's it's about, and it's quite, it's, this might be quite difficult for people to, to take on board, but it's to be prepared that we're going to make errors, unfortunately. As you were saying right at the start, the more stress and pressure that we're under, if you've been on furlough, if you've been working 110 miles an hour right the way through, we're human beings and there's only so far that we can go. So it's it's thinking that looking at human beings now and not thinking we're not going to make incidents or we're not going to make errors. It's looking at them thinking there's a very high chance they can make errors. How can we actually help with them? And it's the assumptions, again, it's not making the assumption that people are just going to uh, start where they left off. Nice, easy, basic introduction of what it is. Even if we can back to basics, discussing the role, what the role is, if they think their role's actually changed, if it has changed, we'll help them guide them through that process, looking at procedures. Procedures are a very good way of just slowing down the decision-making process. And if your procedures aren't right, and if something starts to go wrong and you follow the procedure, they could find themselves in a bit of a predicament. So it's looking at procedures, making sure that they're okay, and it's just helping each other out. We're going to go mm -hmm. back, we're all going to be in this situation. So if you've got two, three, four, whatever's in your team, it's just acknowledging we could make errors, helping each other out. And it's how you react to that errors as well. And the, the open door policy and work's probably never been more important. And it's really important that we adhere to it. And it's just, from a behavioral point of view, it's just going back to the basics to ensure that our brain can take in and process the information. Yeah, no, that's great, Scott. Thank you. And I think I'm, I'm, you know, again, the past year has been difficult for everybody and in different ways and, and, and people have sort of endured different things and, and, and have responded to them differently. And I think one of the, one of the things I'm hearing and in, in within organizations and sort of between um, organizations is um, groups of people that got to stay home and work and people that had to go in and and even within an organization sort of you got a manufacturing floor maybe and some office folks and as we are trying to as you say help each other out because we're not going to get everyone back to work if we don't help each other out recognizing that there may be some of that that undercurrent going on about 
who got to stay home and, and work and be safe and, and who, who really was slogging it out at 110 miles an hour. And I think that's part of that recognition process of helping each other out for sure. Um, so I'm gonna turn, um, as we sort of get uh, touch points with either one, um, please do enter your questions in the, the chat as we're going. I wanna get over to Jay to think, um, Jay, to think about some longer term risk um, scenarios. You know, maybe um, only a small percentage of my clients had pandemic plans to begin with, you know. And as we think about um, risk management, as we start thinking about, you know, getting back to work, planning ahead, you know, dusting off and or creating, um, you know, some or, or planning for a future pandemic, which is not what anyone probably has the energy to do for this. Um, what should that risk management process included? And it's sort of like, what did we learn from all of this? I mean, there have got to be some silver linings from this past year. What what should you know we think about as risk management and and pulling together um, pandemic plans or infectious disease plans? Um, what what goes into that that risk rubric for you, Jayat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so usually sort of um, this sort of planning has been part of business continuity planning uh, and uh, those uh, sort of uh, processes and procedures and not overtly focused on risk management. But for businesses, from an operational standpoint, uh, risk management planning process uh, should include uh, a few things. I think uh, one of them is identification of core essential production and service workflows. Then you have strategic risk management that includes identification, assessment, and mitigation measures in terms of uh, your business and financial impact. Um, then you have to identify supply chain for core operations, identify human resources and organizational hierarchies and workplace resources, identify um, essential worker safety and stockpiling safety equipment, um, identify financial cash flows in, in uh, you know, financial cash flow analysis in emergency situations, and uh, basically, you know, create worst case and best case risk scenarios and planning for both by having recovery plans. And, uh, uh, you know, a plan for recovery and reopening is just as important as a plan for shutdown. So reopening planning must detail efforts to start up from zero activity and scaling to full operations. Um, and you know, maintaining, sustaining at a set level of operation, which might not be the full operation. So, and then you know, we have to plan for monitoring risk, plan for communication, and finally, uh, you know, uh, a plan for like public and private partnerships for not just benefit of the organization, but for the society as a whole, because COVID is a human risk, it's a societal risk, so has to be approached that way because everybody has to uh, work together. That's great. And so, Jan, as we're sort of some parts of the world are are definitely in the the, the thick of things um, for India, for instance, right now in the middle of um, the crisis, what um, you know, or the middle of a surge. Um, uh, what do you what do you suggest for those folks in the middle or in the thick of it? Yeah, um, I think we have a sort of a grim situation in India. And um, I think a lot of it, before I answer your question, I think a lot of it is um, it's risk perception and what informs our risk perception. And uh, I, I, I was hearing stories recently where, um, I mean, in, in February, March, I have family in India, my dad lives there. And in February, March, there was a lot of resistance to taking the vaccine. Um, you know, there were vaccines in the uh, in the hospitals and stuff, but the the lines were not, the queues were not full, and uh, you know, it wasn't that popular. Uh, but now, when they're in the middle of a surge, um, I've been hearing that people are willing to pay some really good amount, and they are paying just to get that vaccine because now everybody wants one. So uh, it's it's interesting to study how risk perception changes when when risks materialize. Uh, but that said, I think when you're in the middle of a surge or when the situation suddenly changes, uh, it's always good to go back to the basics. So you know there is a risk, you evaluate that risk, and uh, you have mitigation measures. And I think um, as as Kevin mentioned, I love the hierarchy of controls. And you can ramp that up and ramp that down depending on the situation and the context. 
The thing is you have to continually reassess risk and continuously reassess mitigation measures and keep that loop up to date and keep your data and information flowing and communication flowing so everybody has the most up-to-date information. And finally, you, you must monitor and review effectiveness of your hierarchy of controls and then you know keep on keep on uh, you know updating mitigation measures as needed. So it's uh, it's going back to the basics really and not not giving in to perceptions of low or high risk as uh, you know I think as Scott called out biases and heuristics which cause us to take shortcuts sometimes and not assess data objectively as we would like as we would think we would do but but we don't. So that that is also very important in a crisis situation. Yeah, that reiteration process, that reevaluation of the hierarchy of controls has been so important. I mean, we are drinking from a scientific fire hose, mm -hmm. you know, as we've, you know, everybody early on, everybody was going to clean their way out of this mess, right? And so now we understand the the fomite risk is lower. We can pull back on the cleaning, um, the, the the ventilation, as we truly understand how. airborne and recognize the airborne component of this how important the ventilation system evaluations are so I that reiteration process um, is so important on the on, on picking your hierarchy of controls right to, to give us all those layers of protection and I think I've been hearing some frustration right because the people say well didn't you know that already and it was sort of mm -hmm. and science is not this static process and as, as we iterate I think the public gets a little frustrated with us scientists but um, hopefully they can can stick around a little bit longer. Um, you know, I want to I want to bring us back around to, to the vaccination topic, which I know is pretty hot, controversial in some areas. Um, and so I'm going to have a little round of questions here about specifically about some vaccinations. And Jay, um, I'll start with you. How are risk managers viewing the unvaccinated? Loaded yes, question. Sir. Yeah, uh, the short and uh, rather objective answer to that is that unvaccinated employees are risk and just like any risk there's a probability associated with it and there's a severity of impact and the variable of interest here is transmissibility so depending on what the unvaccinated employee is doing the risk may be very high or non-existent so objectively speaking again risks need to be mitigated and mitigations could be specific uh, targeted or they could be blanket you know depends on employer and depends on transmissibility risk associated with the unvaccinated employee. Uh, it's important to rehash though that data information and communications as Michael mentioned uh, which informs risk perception can also be a mitigator in case of human risks because humans are decision makers and decision makers under stress with heuristic and biases as Scott said uh, you know that that is very important to understand and uh, you know feed into your risk management process at this point though the strongest mitigation we have at this point is the vaccine and uh, you know again going to the hierarchy of controls th many of them could be used as mitigators depending on the context of the situation but must be kept in mind at this point the strongest mitigator we have is the vaccine yeah. great kevin in your role what are you seeing um your members propose as accommodations for the unvaccinated you know a typical disability accommodation doesn't really fit here so as we're trying to accommodate those who won't or can't get vaccinated what are you seeing as some options i mean it's it it it's a really really interesting picture at the moment uh, i know that there's some uh, there's still so much that not understood about how even the, the current sort of strains are being spread. And while you've still got sort of vulnerable people within the workplace, and some of those vulnerable people are the people who can't or won't take vaccines, then you know, this we're still in this situation. You know, in one way, Jayat, I agree with you that the, the vaccine is the strongest mitigator, but it's only it's it's a sort of a discriminatory one, it's a sort of a self-selecting one. And if you think about the typical means by which you control risk within the workplace, you try not to have discriminatory sort of methods of control, ones that will only work to, for a small group of people or a, even a large group of people. And so the, the challenge is to sort of say, well, what's a proportionate response in terms of having 
effective controls which are going to be sort of general and non-discriminatory and what now to what extent can you take take this sort of you know the relax on certain things and before vaccines social distancing actually the physical distance between people you know was probably the strongest um uh, mechanism that you have keeping people out of the work but as you go to full capacity then you're looking at more people in the smaller spaces and you're rapidly sort of condensing if you like the the um opportunities to have your only other really really effective control so i think you know in in certain areas um the the response is you know how big's the risk and what do you do with the people who are at risk you remove them from the workplace and then that creates a different type of problem because what we haven't talked about is social risk you know the the pandemic with lockdowns has probably been the most dissociating um impact you know people work together as teams often they look after each other's backs they look after um the risks to other people sometimes they're better at looking after other people than they are looking after themselves but the communications pathways that the interactions between people have been broken down and when we get back to work we're not just getting back to work as stressed individuals we're getting back to work having lost some of the skills of communication and skills of mutual risk management and so reinforcing some of the things that michael and scott have, have said you know there's a degree of relearning and i think one of the most effective tools about you know mitigating the vaccine is that communication and seeing people rebuilding the societies within workplaces and understanding that it's a shared risk um and that you need to communicate um so a lot of michael's points about the one to ones etc managing anxiety but also vulnerability really really important great yeah that's important kevin i think um we're seeing um these factions develop of vaccinated and unvaccinated and 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 the the unfortunate social piece that's going to go with that scott can you comment about um sort of where what you think that might do to folks in getting them back and and getting them safely working i've heard people say oh i'm not going to go back to work if i'm going to have to stand next to somebody who's unvaccinated all day long where do you see that playing out or how do you see that playing out in and you know all the myriad of other things that other folks are trying to get back to work safely oh it's a tricky one eh? it's 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 weird because what we were saying earlier about the the normal and the new normal it's even things with beginning to open back up and things so one of my friends was talking the other day said he can't wait to get back to the pub and i was like well i'm a bit a bit like it's putting the feet of god into me because being around that amount of people again is just not something that i'm used to and i think we have to take that again into the work setting whether it's it's vaccinated or not is people are going to find it difficult working in groups again and as exactly as Kevin was saying there, everything we need to place emphasis on the teamwork, the communication, and everything that we thought that we once had. And we uh, basically, as we're all saying, is it's going back to the basics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all those priors of, well, I got vaccinated. How come you didn't? Just the 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 context of, yeah, I love that concept of rebuilding the the societies in the workplace with this new thing in there. I mean, I never before people sort of said hey geez have you gotten your measles vaccine or i don't even really think there was a conscious conversation about hey did you get your flu vaccine like it's just it's going to be it's going to be interesting and new to navigate and i think michael i'm going to pitch one out to you which is something that's super concerning for me as a public health practitioner and epidemiologist um the younger folks so we're seeing in a lot of our pulse surveys and it's not just in the us um it's in um uh, prevalent in, in europe and asia as well um, not so much in South America, which I don't understand, which is the younger folks, these 18 to 29 year olds who um, aren't necessarily saying they're hesitant to get the vaccine. They don't have a, a safety question or an efficacy concern or whatnot. They're apathetic, right? So they, they need maybe a different message. Um, and, and, and part of the surveys I'm reading are saying, well, if I get sick, I'm not gonna get that sick, you know? So they're just, 
that 18 to 29 year old crowd, do you have any comments on, on, on the special communication to um, encourage folks um, on the vaccination front that isn't necessarily um, a hesitation, but more of an apathy? Sure. Um, actually, a lot of my work is still in the higher education sector. So I do a lot of work around student communication, student engagement. And I think um, one thing that we need to avoid as employers um, and in our industries is talking down to, to younger people. I think a lot of our government rhetoric, um, a lot of the language and the tone of employer communications can be very parental in style. And it can be, um, it, it can feel quite patronising, quite quite condescending for any any demographic, I think. But but for our young people who are particularly savvy, um, they are very discursive in, in, in exploring concepts and ideas. They discuss things in their own spaces, their own social media spaces, and they develop um, real confidence in their own thinking, their own positioning. It's important that we communicate with authenticity. So what, what I would be advocating there is that we, again, I, I've already mentioned the concept, but we identify champions. Um, perhaps these are young people, young employees, for example, within that age band of 18 to 29, who can distill and translate and communicate some of those messages for us. They can act as ambassadors and advocates for uh, the, the need for vaccination. They can roll out some of this information. And again, it's not feeling top down it's not feeling like it's parent to children and um, it's not feeling as though it's too instructive or too prescriptive but they were providing a, a transparency of information we're um, providing facts so we're saying look yes young people um, won't be as badly affected by by the pandemic you are more resilient you're not one of the at-risk groups but as an organization as an employer it's important that we get back to capacity and that means making sure that all of our workforce is safe, including those who are who are older than you. To help us to do that, we know that vaccinating the whole of our community can be effective. And um, these are the statistics. This is the data. This is why it's important. And then here are some case studies of people in your age group who have been vaccinated. They'll tell you, you know, that, that, that they did it, that they were perhaps skeptical or apathetic about it, but they've done it. It was, you know, pain free. It's helped, and they did it because they're wanting to help the broader workforce. They're wanting to help their organization, their business, their company get back up to full capacity, get back up to full speed, to fulfill orders, to, to meet requirements, to meet deadlines, whatever it might be. So I think speaking to young people um, with authenticity, with uh, clarity, with transparency, and using advocates and ambassadors within their community to help deliver that message, I think is a way of breaking through some of that um yeah some of the, the the apathy that's there perhaps from from young people yeah no that's great michael and i think it's it's really important i think the younger crowd might need a more community-minded message um it seems to be resonating with some of my groups and in, in higher ed it's sort of you know the power of the vaccine is me right i got vaccinated i'm protected but the the real power is the we right so each of our own individual vaccinations is so much more impactful and meaningful when everyone around us is vaccinated as well um yeah, you know, yes. and, and Shannon, in terms of channels as well you know we know that young people are consuming huge amounts of video content for example uh, we know that they're engaging very fully in social media discussions so again older generations also use social media but tend the data shows they tend to dip in and out, they, they, they read it, they absorb information, but they're not engaging quite as much as young people do. Uh, this is very much their social space. It's where they build relationships, where they form opinions. So again, using the power of social media for good and using um, rich media like video um, could be again, very effective at engaging young people. So it, it's not a, a a memo from the managers that says you must, must get vaccinated, but it's a video about the power of vaccinations to uh, protect communities and to restart economies and to revitalize or re-energize business. I think it's you have an opportunity with, with more emotive content, more storytelling, I think, to engage 
young people uh, in, in the platforms, in the spaces where they're really active. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Kevin, I'm going to toss one out to you a little bit. Again, another 30,000 foot view policy question. Um, in the states, um, again, we've got about um, 100 um, colleges and universities that are going to mandate the vaccine. I have some healthcare settings that are going to mandate vaccines. But in stateside, I don't have any other clients that are mandating. Um, how do you see that rolling out for your members? Um, um, I think some of it's hinging on um, getting full approval for the vaccines right now um, in the states. Most of them have emergency use authorizations. But do you? Where's the conversation going around mandates? Yay or nay? Was that coming to me? Sorry, I've missed it. Yeah, yeah, seven. Sorry, uh, Kevin. I just yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a fascinating one because you no, know, especially in Europe, um, you've got a very strong sort of um, human rights culture with a particular model about therapy and therapeutic engagement being something that is consensual. So it goes right to the heart of the European experience because if you remember sort of during the war, the sort of Nazis were using sort of various forms of, sort of eugenics and using experimentation on people. So built very hardwired into the state apparatus is the restraint on that. Now, obviously, you know, those restraints aren't, aren't absolute, but they they are based, they are, they are pretty strong. Um, and so there's a sort of a, this very strong ethical and human rights dimension to it. And then there's a pragmatism, isn't there? And the pragmatism is about the, 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 the relationship between the employee and the employer. Um, and in, in terms of the employment context, you know, clearly a person who decides not to be vaccinated is, is you know, presenting a risk to themselves, but potentially a risk to others. And it's this interim period where vaccination is important as a public health exclusionary power um, that's really important. But the reality, I think, is the debate will keep moving towards Michael's area, which is that it's about communicating because vaccination is really a public health protection as opposed to an abs absolute workplace protection. It's never going to be able to affect 100% of people because there's always going to be a tiny minority who can't avail themselves of. So the mandating of vaccination is very interesting, but I mean, it's interesting hearing Scott talk about pubs. You know, the most lively debate in the UK, you won't be surprised, Shannon, was, is, it was probably ignited about you know, whether pubs could sort of say, you need a vaccine passport to have a pint. And in, in a strange kind of way, it reinforces sort of Michael's point about, you know, what are the social influences? You know, an employer saying you've got to do this for your job, you're going to get taken to court. And actually, I, I, I suspect in a lot of European countries, you know, the, 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 the complaining employee is probably going to win because there's going to be something procedurally wrong in the way in which it's being mandated. Um, because actually the type of organisation that tells their staff, you've got to do this, hasn't sold it to them that they want to do it. The type of organisation, Michael, I think works to sort of eradicate from existence. That's the type of organization that also makes it mistakes in consultation. But the probably the power is going to come from these sort of social engagement. You know, if you can't go and see a sports match, if you can't go to the nightclub, if you can't be a member of social society without showing it, then I suspect that will move a whole lot of people on. Yeah, yeah. And we're seeing that in the um the group. So we've been monitoring closely the pulse surveys over the last year. And the percentage of people that say, I'm going to wait and see, is, is definitely going down. And one of the key components of, you know, what information do you need to, you know, make your decision to finally get one? And a lot of people now sort of moved off from the safety and the efficacy issues. Now folks are saying, I'll get a vaccine if it impedes my movement. So, so same thing. So it'll be, an, it's going to be a very interesting societal question. So as we're um, coming to the end, I'm going to do a quick round robin here of last thoughts and comments. Um, Scott, I'll start off with you. Anything else pressing that you wanted to get out there or wanted to remind folks of? Uh, no, the mine really is. Just remember that 
people's ability to take in and process information, regardless if they've been working right through or furloughed, has changed. So go back to basics, keep it simple. Um, I think somebody else mentioned earlier, don't overload people and take everybody as an individual. But please remember that this thing up here is not doing what it's programmed to do when we go back to work, unfortunately. Great. Yeah. Good dose of kindness and compassion. I think go with that too. Um, thanks. Jayat, how about you? Any last thoughts? Yeah, I'm right there with Scott. Uh, you know, data and information inform our knowledge and wisdom, and that leads to risk perception. So, uh, you know, and as far as organizations are concerned, uh, there's a there's a saying which uh, we have in mind is that you know always have uh, big ears, uh, big eyes, small mouth, and a big heart. <laughs> Love that, perfect. <laughs> and Michael, how about you? I didn't get to ask you my pressing question, which is, can you over communicate during a crisis? Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely think you can. I think again, it's about being mindful of your audiences and and what is the information that they need. What are the concerns that they have? So it's that listening piece, uh, which is, which is, you know, um, it's about proportionality. It's, it's listening is more important than just imposing or broadcasting information. You know, and, and communications is really important. I think the, the, communications isn't something you do at the end of a process. Once you've developed a policy and you've made decisions, you then communicate it right at the end. It's something you need to think about right at the very beginning. How do we want to? Um, achieve and deliver cultural change? How do we want to create a sense of community, a sense of confidence amongst our, our workforce and our stakeholders? And how do we do that through active listening uh, and through communications, which is strategic? So I would direct people to the, um, the feature that I've written for the latest IIRSM Sentinel magazine, which talks about crisis communications being rooted in strategy. Now, starting with the, the mission and the vision and the objectives of your business, rooting your communications in the values of your organization, and then, yeah, making sure that communications is two-way, that you're listening, and that it's a continuous cycle of, of improvement so that you can enrich the, the organizations that you work for with a, with a real sense of community. Great. Thank you. And Kevin, how about you? Any last uh, parting words or thoughts? Yeah, I, uh, strategy and communications and all of these things are means to one particular end, which is collective responsibility, collective action. And if we've seen one amazing thing out of COVID is where before in history have you seen people willing to put the economy on hold, their social lives on hold, everything on hold to protect the vulnerable. And if there is ever a really sort of progress focused positive statement that collective action is worth it to show save risk to people you don't know and possibly are already vulnerable then this is it so there's a tremendous hope story out of this and hope i think has a vital place to play in any form of risk management Excellent. Yeah, totally. Couldn't agree more, Kevin. Thank you so much. So I think we got to um, some of the questions that showed up ahead of time, some questions that came in. Um, I know the session is being recorded. Um, so thank you, everybody, for participating. Um, super interesting.